seek these things, but seek ye first the kingdom. Not only seek, but seek it first. You know, set your affection on things above. You know, next year, there's a lot going on. You know, my niece has set her date to get married in April, but her plans, what she needs to be seeking first is the kingdom. She needs to be seeking the Lord and his righteousness. 
Okay? The Lord will bless you if you put him first. Seek those things which are above. He says, take no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient in the day is the evil thereof. You know, Christ, in the book of Colossians, when I'm uh, talking to you, he was talking to the church at Colossae. And he says, if you then be risen with Christ, if you then be risen with Christ, he's talking about the doctrine of representation. When Christ died on the cross of Calvary, we died with him. When he rose victorious, we rose with him. And that's the same thing with regeneration. When Christ turns that heart of stone and turns it into a heart of flesh, you are risen with Christ. You are born again. Blessed is the man whom thou causes to approach unto thee. It's not your will. It's his will. It's not your way. It's his way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way that will be in heaven. So let's don't seek those things that perish here on earth. They, they're soon gone. Those things that we try to collect, that we seek so much here in this life, they're going to be gone one day. Set your affection on him above. If you've been risen with Christ, we are risen with Christ. You know, one of my favorite uh, things in Mark chapter 16, when they came to the grave, they came to the sepulcher. It says, and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a song, in a long white garment, and they were frightened. And he said unto them, Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Why? You seek Jesus. That's why you're not to be afraid. When you seek Jesus, there's nothing to be afraid of. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's where all our heavenly blessings come from, down from the Father of lights. Be not afraid when you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. To us that are saved, it is the power of God. It's the power of God that worketh salvation. I'm telling you, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. That is the gospel. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be affrighted. You seek Jesus. You don't have to be frightened today when you seek Jesus. Why? Because he's crucified. He is risen. He is out of the grave. He is victorious. We are justified by his resurrection. Jesus was raised. We were Seek those things which are above. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place. But go your way. Tell the disciples, Peter, and go before you into Galilee, that there you shall see him as he said unto you. And what did they do? They went out quickly. They went out quickly. What did they do? They went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, and for they trembled and were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. He was risen early. They went out quickly. They saw Jesus. They went to the sepulchre. They told him not to be afraid. You seek Jesus. And I'm telling you, that's the gospel message today. When you seek first the kingdom, you seek Jesus. That's what it's all about. It's not about you and I. We need to be seeking his righteousness. That's our righteousness. He is our salvation. His blood was shed for you and for me. And he was rose over victorious over death, hell, and the grave. In 2024, let's seek for keep saying we got several weeks. I'm going to be gone most of December. I'm not going to be able to talk to you. I'm not going to be able to preach to you. I'm not going to be able to exhort you in a way. I'm telling you, don't seek your own righteousness. Seek him and him crucified. Seek the Lord Jesus. You know, the psalmist says, um, look what uh, David says in Psalm 63, verse 1. He says, O oh God, thou art my God. You know, the psalmist David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my keeper. He's the one that takes care of me. Why shouldn't I seek him first? Why shouldn't I put all my, you know, chips in on that basket? He's never failed you. He's never failed me. The grave couldn't hold him. He was victorious over that. He's victorious over all the enemies, death, the devil, and the grave. He is victorious. Seek ye first the kingdom. He knows what you stand in need of. Don't put him second and third on the list when you're doing a budget, when, whatever your plans are ahead in the future. He needs to be at the top of the list. He deserves it. He is worthy of it. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. What do we need to be doing early? We need to be seeking the Lord. 
We don't need to be putting other things in front. Let's seek the Lord early. That's what he's saying. My soul thirsteth for thee. My soul has not always thirsted for the living God. My thirst has been on other things. I haven't sought the Lord first. But David's saying, my soul is thirsty. He says, come unto me. James said, exhorts, you know, in practical, he says, draw nigh unto God. And he will what? Draw nigh unto you. Can you imagine the God of all creation, the God who has all power in heaven and earth, telling you and me, he writ in the scriptures through James, draw nigh unto me and what? I will draw nigh unto you. I always picture you drawing towards the Lord and he's drawing back. And I'm talking about a, you're talking about a big bang. I'm talking about a big bang, my friends. <laughs> The Lord is great. The Lord is good. Seek ye first. Draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh unto you. He says, my soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry land where no water is. To see the power and the glory. So I have seen thee in the sanctuary. You know, Jeremiah says, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that what? To seeketh him. It is good. The Lord is good unto them that seek him. The Lord has been good to you and me all of our life. Let's seek him first. He deserves it. Seek ye first the kingdom. Seek the Lord. Draw nigh unto me. He's telling you personally, the Lord is my shepherd. Draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to certain things in this life that will let you down. He ain't going to draw nigh to you. You can draw away from the Lord, but he's promised you. He's promised me. All of the promises of God are yea and amen. He will not fail you. Draw nigh to me. Let's draw near to him with a full assurance of faith, he says in Hebrews. Let's draw nigh. I'm telling you, you won't be let down. I'll let you down. The things of this world will let you down. When we draw away from God and draw closer to those things, we put those things more important than the kingdom. When we put those things in front of the house of God, when we go and uh, set our affections on things beneath and not set our affections on things above. Let's seek him. Let's seek the kingdom first. Like I said, there's other things that we can seek. But let's draw nigh. Let's do like James said. Let's draw nigh to him. How do we draw nigh to him? We can draw nigh to him in prayer, in supplication. We can go to our closet and draw nigh to him. When the psalmist David said, seek him, when he seeks him early in the morning, seek him in prayer, seek him in worship, seek him above all things in this life. And the Lord knows what you stand in need. You, you, you won't come up short with the Lord. <laughs> He'll never shortchange you when you seek him first. He knows how we feel. He knows what we stand in need of. So I encourage you here towards the end of the year. And as you move on into next year, I was talking to my sister-in-law like the first six months of next year is jam-packed. You know, you know, usually the last two or three months of the year is the fastest because there's so much going on. I mean, I've got my brother's turning 50, uh, having a baby <laughs> into January, and my brother's turning 50, and I'm being ordained in the end of March. Give <laughs> me our 20th anniversary with my sweet wife. <laughs> She's turning 40. <laughs> If you didn't know that, there's just so much going on. There's so much, so many things that can come ahead of where my priority should be. And that's seeking first the kingdom, seeking first the Lord. And I'm telling you, all these things, <laughs> he knows what I stand in need of every step of the way. And he does that with all his little children. So let's seek him first. I'm telling you, you'll be blessed, blessed beyond measure. Not, that's not my prescription. That's the Lord's prescription. Amen. He's the great physician. He'll take care of you in time of need. Thank you.
Kendall's message this morning reminded me of Hebrews 11:6, where the writer said, Without faith it's impossible to please him. But he that cometh unto him must believe that he is, and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There are non-seekers, there are seekers, and diligent seekers. Now, we need to ask ourselves the question, which category am I in? Am I a non-seeker? Hopefully not. Am I a seeker? Hopefully yes. But am I a diligent seeker? And we notice the diligent seeker that God rewards. Now, uh, this morning I want to go to the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Luke to introduce my subject matter. We find beginning in verse 27 where a group of people that were known as Sadducees came to the Lord Jesus Christ with a question. And the question had to do with the subject of the resurrection. And they told the Lord that there was a woman whose husband had died and they had no children. And then according to the law, which was correct, she was to marry his brother, to raise up seed in his name, his brother's name. So this happened again, and it happened again, and it happened again, to finally she married seven altogether. And they asked the Lord, in the resurrection, whose husband shall she have? Now the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So you might think, well, why did they ask a resurrection question? Because they thought this particular question would prove there would be no resurrection. Now let's notice the Lord's response to this question. This will be Luke chapter 20, verse 34. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which should be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. It's amazing how much you can learn from the Word of God in just a few words. I would consider the resurrection, the end of time, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be very important subjects. And they are, and they're covered in detail in God's Word. But in this brief response that the Lord gave unto the Sadducees, He proved that there is a resurrection. And in this statement here, we find that in the resurrection, in heaven, there will be no marriage or given in marriage. And in this life, yes, we're told that there's a present world and that world. In this world, this present world, men marry and are given in marriage, but in that world. So we have two worlds. We have this world and we have that world. That world is heaven. In this world, we have marriages. In that world, we will not have marriages. In this world, we have death. In that world, there will be no death. We should be like the angels of God. Now, we learned a lot right there, didn't we? About what's going to happen at the end of time. This is really important information, and you'd be surprised at how many people are not aware of what I just read to you, what I just said to you, and don't have that understanding. But I want us to look at this expression that the Lord gave here. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. They which shall be accounted worthy. How are they accounted worthy when we know that salvation is by the grace of God? How are they accounted worthy when we know the scripture teaches abundantly in many different places? That salvation is not based upon man's will, not based upon man's works. He cannot earn it. He cannot win it. He cannot merit it in any way whatsoever. So how are they accounted worthy to obtain that resurrection? Well, the subject of worthiness is an important subject in the Word of God. I read in God's Word where there are several well-known individuals who plainly declared that they were not worthy. And then I read where the Lord says there are people who are not worthy. And yet here's a text that tells me that they which shall be accounted worthy of that resurrection. 
And this subject, like many subjects in the Word of God, obviously has to be rightly divided, and it has both an eternal and also a timely application to it. Think of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 10, verses 36 and 37. The Lord said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Let that sink in just for a moment. He that loveth father or mother more than me. Now, he did not say you should not love your father and mother, right? He said, if you love them more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. Now, I had a wonderful father, a wonderful mother, and I believe I loved my father and mother just as much as you loved yours, and I'm sure you loved yours just as much as you loved mine, or you do love yours now if they, you're blessed for them still to be living. But he said, if you love your mother and father more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. Then the Lord's blessed us with four children, three sons and a daughter. We currently have 10, uh, 11, 11 grandchildren. And hopefully in, in a couple months, we'll have a, a 12th one. And, and we love them dearly. Karen, I love them dearly. But Jesus said, if I love them more than I love him, I'm not worthy of him. You see, without the Lord, we wouldn't have a family, would we? Without the Lord, I wouldn't have had a mother and a father. I wouldn't have children to, to hug and to embrace and to, and to cherish. I wouldn't have a, a wife as a companion and a strong support. I wouldn't have any of that were it not for the Lord. In the first chapter of James, we read, where every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, then there is no fairness, neither shadow of turning. I owe everything to the Lord. I owe my life to the Lord. He allows me to breathe the air that he put it in here for me to breathe in the work of creation. I owe everything to him. I should love the Lord first. And if I don't love the Lord first, I'm not going to do what Brother Tim has been speaking to us about this morning. I'm not going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But if I love the Lord first, and that's, that's the key to all things. I was speaking to Shane and Bradley yesterday on some things concerning marriage. And I tried to emphasize the commitment to the Lord first. Now, you've got to have a commitment to one another. But if you're committed to the Lord, then you can be committed as a husband, committed as a wife. If you're not committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ, your commitment as a husband and wife is not going to be what it should be. Then he says, he that loveth himself more than me <laughs> is not worthy of me. The Lord here gives us a, some, a category of people that are not worthy of him. If we love father and mother, son or daughter, your, your own self more than him, you're simply not worthy of me. Now, I look at the life of Jacob, for example. Go to Genesis chapter 32 and look at verse 10, and you're going to find one of the most uh, commendable prayers in the Scripture. And of all people, it comes to the lips of a man named Jacob. Jacob here says, I'm not worthy, O Lord, of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth I have shown thy servant. He says, for I, at one time, he says, I was just traveling with one staff, and now I've become two bands. Now, these two bands represent all his family. And over the past 20 years in Jacob's life, he's accumulated a large family. He has Rachel, he has Leah as his wife, he has some concubines, and he has 12 sons, and those sons have children. So the last 20 years have been very fruitful and productive in the life of Jacob from that point of view. But here he says, I'm not worthy the least of all the mercies of the truth I have shown thy servant. And he told the truth. <laughs> he was not. Now, where, where are we at in the life of Jacob right here? It's very important you notice this. Where are we at in the life of Jacob right here? Well, we're 20 years removed from something that happened 20 years before that's recorded in Genesis chapter 27. In chapter 27, you'll find where Jacob and his mother deceived his father and her husband, Isaac, and deceived him to the point that he gave a blessing unto Jacob that he had purposed to give to his brother Esau. And when it's all said and done, he got the blessing. But he did it through scheming. He did it through lying. He did it through deception. He and his mother worked together to do all of that. 
And then we find Esau coming on the scene. And this is the last thing we read about Esau for 20 years. The Bible says that Esau was very angry with Jacob and purposed in his heart to slay Jacob. At the right time, he was in his heart to kill his own brother. His own brother had treated him with anything less than kind. I mean, not, not with any kindness whatsoever. Remember when he came in from the field and he was tired and he was weary and he was hungry and everything else? And he asked his brother from Mesopotamia, what, what in the world did Jacob do? He said, well, I'll give it to you, okay, if you'll tell me your birthright. Now, we're talking about two brothers who were in the womb of their mother at the same time. And when they were born, we find Esau was born first, but as he came out, Jacob's hand was on the heel of Esau. <laughs> That's written for a purpose. That is written for us to know and understand. Even at this age, as a little baby coming out of his mother's womb, Jacob was already living up to his name, which means supplanter and trickster. He had taken hold to the foot of Esau as he came out of his mother's womb. You're not going to hear anything from Esau for 20 years. We're 20 years down the road. When Jacob left home, his mother wanted him to go to her brother's place, which would be his, his uncle Laban. She says, I want you to tarry there for a few days until the fury of your brother passes. Well, it's been 20 years. I don't know what your definition of a few days is. Mine's not 20 years. But people have different definitions for different expressions, right? I don't think anybody here this morning would say, if I said, what, what would be your definition of a few days? Somebody would say, well, 20 years is a few days. No, I think 20 years is more than just a few days, wouldn't you? But in her mind, in Rachel's mind, he'd just be gone a few days. She'd come back. Esau would get over all of this. Yeah, he'd have disappointment, but he'd get over all this. But he didn't. And now 20 years down the road, Jacob says, I'm not worthy of the least of thy mercies. All the truth I have shown thy servant. Now during this past 20 years, Jacob went from being just one person with a pilgrim staff. That's all he had in his hand when he got to the place where Uncle Laban lived. That's all he had, a pilgrim staff. What's he got now? He's got wives, he's got children, He's got a big family, he's got cattle, he's got gold, he's got silver. God has blessed him immeasurably in taking care of him very graciously in a way that would display God's great mercy in his life. And here for a moment of time, Jacob realizes that. Now see, Jacob had an encounter in Genesis 28 with the Lord. He met the Lord in Genesis chapter 28. And in that encounter, we find where he laid down that night and used rocks to go on his head for a pillow. But during the night, he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw a ladder extend from earth right into heaven, an angel ascending and descending upon that ladder. And the Lord spoke to him and reminded him of a covenant that he'd made with his father Isaac and also with his father Abraham and reminded him how he was going to bless him to inherit the land in which he was in at that very present time. And all Jacob has right now is himself. 20 years later, things have changed. He's going to meet angels again here in Genesis chapter 32. It's how the chapter opens up. Those angels came and pronounced the great blessing of God in Genesis 28. Now those angels come in Genesis chapter 32 and they're here to show that God is going to protect him because in Genesis 32, he's going to meet his brother Esau who he hadn't seen in 20 years. And the last time he saw him, the last time he heard him, Esau is talking about how much he hates him and how much he's going to take his life. He hadn't seen or heard him in 20 years. So the angel of God appeared to him. But you know, Jacob live right up to his name, right in this situation here. He starts scheming, he starts planning, he starts using deceptive practices, one thing and another, because he's anticipating. He knows he cannot get back to Bethel where God has instructed him to go without going to a place called Mount Seir, and that's where Esau lives. He knows in all likelihood he's going to have an encounter with Esau. And God, knowing that, God sends a band of angels there to show him, I'm going to be with you, Jacob. I'm going to protect you. You see, if Esau slays Jacob, the promises of God cannot be fulfilled. 
You have to think about these kind of things. If God allows Esau to slay Jacob, then how is he going to allow Jacob and his seed to inherit the land? It can't happen. Now, Jacob knows what the promises are, but instead of relying on God and trusting in God, he does what our human nature is prone to do. We start scheming, we start planning, we start trusting in ourselves instead of trusting in the Lord. Then we come down to this prayer. Jacob says, Lord, he says, I'm not worthy of the least of thy mercies. He knew that God had bestowed mercy after mercy after mercy after mercy upon him in his life. He knew he was not deserving of his preservation. He was not deserving of his own life at this particular time. So he comes to God. And even though he's been planning and scheming, ignoring the fact that God has sent these angels, I commend him entirely for this prayer. Lord, I am not worthy of the least, which means I'm not worthy of any of them. If you're not worthy of the least, you're not worthy of any of them. I don't know how, how the total would have been in, in his life, but do you know the total of mercies that you've received with God in your life? Can, can you number them? Can you say, well, God's been merciful to me 137 times. God has been merciful to me 222 times. Now, can anybody say anything like that? I don't think so. Because, you know, every day you live is a display of God's mercy in your life, according to Jeremiah. He says... In the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, so the Lord's mercy is that we're not consumed. And they're new how often? Every month, every year? No, they're new every morning. We got another fresh display of God's mercy. We got out of the bed this morning, didn't we? We're still breathing. We're still walking. We're upright. <laughs> we're here in the house of God with the Lord's people around the word of God. We worship in the Lord's house with the promise of God's, God to be with us and have God's presence. So the Lord's mercies, we're not consumed. They're new every morning. Thy compassions fail not. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, what a powerful verse this is. What powerful words. God's faithfulness is great. His compassions do not fail. His mercies are new every morning. It's based on those mercies that we're not consumed individually, collectively. That's why we're here this morning. Jacob says, I'm not worthy, at least of thy mercy. Oh, of the truth I have shown thy servant. Jacob recognized the truth that he understood about God came to him by the revelation of God. God showed it to him. He says, and I'm not worthy of that. Well, that's a true statement. Jacob was not worthy of that. Let's go over to the New Testament, take a look at a man named John the Baptist. The Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, of men that are born of, woman, of women, there is not any man been born greater than John the Baptist. Now see, John didn't say, I'm the greatest of all men that's been born. John didn't say this about himself. We find this statement said about John the Baptist by the Lord Jesus Christ, so I know it's true. The Lord said of men, men born of women, there's not been a man born greater than John the Baptist. But he that's least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now when he makes that statement, he's not talking about in, per, in, in the person of John the Baptist. He's talking about the degrees of light and knowledge and understanding. Now John the Baptist came to prepare a people, make ready a people prepare it of the Lord. He came as a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. But John the Baptist didn't have the privilege of walking with the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years in the ministry of the Savior like the apostles did. He didn't have the same privileges, you might say, of watching Jesus do all the miracles that Jesus did. Remember, they had to remind John about this when he was in prison. Those who came after him, the apostles who came after him, they had greater degrees of light and understanding, greater experiences from that point of view, and so do you. You've got the entire Bible before you this morning. You've got the in New Testament that describes the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in vivid detail. John the Baptist didn't have that. Oh, when it comes to comparing John the Baptist as a person to me, that, that can't apply to me. John the Baptist fulfilled his course. He died a young man. He was beheaded for taking a stand for righteousness sake. He died a young man. But the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 13 and verse 35 that he fulfilled his course. 
He did exactly what God called him to do. He called him to be a forerunner of his son, a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, to prepare a people that God had made ready. Oh, God can make ready a people. But John the Baptist had the privilege of preparing the Israelites, the Jewish people, for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, in John, and in Acts, five times. All four Gospels and also the book of Acts, you're going to find this statement concerning John the Baptist. In John's own words, he says, I am not worthy. He says, he that cometh after me is preferred before me because he was before me. Now, let me just pause on that for a second. How can that be true? John the Baptist was born before the Lord Jesus Christ about three months. John the Baptist, from a human, from a human perspective, and the Lord Jesus Christ were kin. John was born first. John's ministry became first. But he says, he that cometh after me is preferred before me because he was before me. He's talking about the deity and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ the eternal sonship of the Savior. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. And he says, I am not worthy to loose the shoe latches of his shoes. Now that was a servant's task, a servant's job in that day. A servant would take off the shoes of his master. He would undo the buckles of the master and take the shoes off. He then would take them and place them in the proper place. He would then take his master, perhaps a to a place where he could be refreshed one thing or another. That was a servant's task, a servant's job. But John says, I'm not even worthy of that. I am not worthy to loose the shoes of the one that's coming after me that's preferred before me because he was before me. Let's take a look at John's life. Remember what the Lord said about John. Of all men born of woman. You might say, why would he say something like that? Has, has it ever been a man born any other way? <laughs> no. Job 14, 1, man that's born of woman is few days and full of trouble. Has man ever been born any other way than out of woman? No. He hasn't. It's just kind of reminding us sometimes of just basic elementary things, right? <laughs> man is born of woman is few days and full of trouble. And that's a fact. Our experiences say what Job said was true. But he says of men born of women or, men, or born of a woman, there's not been a man born greater than John the Baptist. But yet John says, I am not worthy to lose a shoe lashes of his shoes. I'm not worthy to bear his shoes. We're told that five times. Matthew tells us, Mark tells us, Luke tells us, John tells us, Luke tells us again in the book of Acts. Why tell us that many times about this man? The Lord knows that we have to have things repeated, doesn't he? He just knows that. We have such a tendency to lose things and forget things. We have a tendency to let things slip. And Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 2, he says, Let us give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For how should we escape if we neglect so great salvation? We have to work to keep things from slipping all the time, don't we? Every once in a while, Karen says, you're, You know, I think you're losing it. I said, speak for yourself. <laughs> I've never had a time in my life when I've had more to remember than I have right now. I haven't. I have more to remember, more to think about, more people to consider one thing or another than I've had in my entire lifetime. I have the largest, my family's the largest it's ever been. I think about them daily. Our children, their spouses, their children, grandchildren, the Lord's church here. I have more to think about than I've ever had in my entire life. So I think it's just natural. Every once in a while, you might forget something. John the Baptist said, I am not worthy. The Lord tells us this five times, recorded five times in the Bible for our consideration. If John the Baptist is not worthy, how in the world could I possibly be worthy? Remember Isaiah and Malachi both talked about the Lord sending a man by the name of Elijah. In the New Testament days, he's talking about John the Baptist because he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. They both dressed alike. They both came pronouncing judgment. 
They both lived out of the ordinary, unusual lives, etc. Now, one thing was different. Elisha performed miracles and John the Baptist did not. But John still came in the spirit of Elijah and in the power of Elijah. John the Baptist was born supernaturally. His mother's name was Elizabeth. And when she conceived, she was old and well stricken in years and were by nature, it was impossible for her to conceive. But she did. She had a son and he was named from heaven just like the Lord Jesus Christ was. God gave his name as John. Of all boys born into the world, the number one name that is given boys born in this world is the name John. Just like the number one name for girls is Mary. John the Baptist was born according to prophecy. John the Baptist had a miraculous experience in his mother's womb. Remember when he was in his mother's womb before he was ever born and we find where Mary and Elizabeth being cousins met in the hill country? And as Mary approached, something miraculous happened in the womb of Elizabeth. She felt John the Baptist moving around and kicking. You say, what, what's so unusual about that? All babies do that. Well, I'll agree with all that, but all babies don't, shout, all babies don't jump for joy, I tell you that. John the Baptist leapt for joy in his mother's womb at the salutation at the very moment that Mary spoke, John the Baptist in the mother, his mother's womb, he leapt for joy. That tells me he was already born of the Spirit of God before he was born naturally. He was always born, already born of the Spirit of God before he had seen the light of day. That's one of the great examples of God's grace that God has given us to, to examine here in this world. That tells me then if a child in his mother's womb does not make it out, unfortunately, that's not going to hear to God from boarding that child of the Spirit of God. John the Baptist had a miraculous conception and a miraculous birth. He came and he baptized the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jordan's River. What an honor that must have been. But notice what John said. When Jesus walked a good distance to come to George River and baptize at the hands of John the Baptist, John says, Lord, he says, uh, you know, he tried to resist him. He said, I have need to be baptized of thee. But the Lord said, Suffer it to be so, John, for it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness is according to the will of God for you to baptize me in George River. And when he told him that, John took him down into the river and baptized him. Why was Jesus baptized? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why was Jesus baptized? I know what baptism is for us. It's for sinners. <laughs> Jesus wasn't a sinner. Baptism is for those who realize and recognize they are sinners. And being sinners, they need a Savior. And they, are recon they recognize this. They are, they are a sinner in awareness. There are a lot of sinners in this world who are not aware that they're a sinner. What makes you aware that you're a sinner is the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you after you've been born of the Spirit of God that enables you and shows you that you're a sinner. As I said numerous times here, I can talk to you about sin. I can talk to you about what a sinner is. I can talk to you to give you the definitions of sin, one thing or another. But I can never convince anybody that they are a sinner except God. He's the only one that can do that. I can teach you about it, but I cannot teach you to feel that you're a sinner. That comes in the work of the new birth. John the Baptist had a miraculous conception. He had a miraculous birth. He's going to baptize the Lord Jesus Christ. He was baptized not because he was a sinner. The Lord Jesus Christ baptized as an example of what was going to take place in his life in, 30, in three and a half years from that time, the Lord Jesus Christ would be crucified. He'd be buried in a barred tomb. And after three days and three nights, he'd be resurrected from the grave victorious over death, hell, and the grave in this world here, and his baptism in the beginning of his ministry portrayed that. It also gave authenticity to the ministry of John the Baptist. When John the Baptist baptized the Lord Jesus Christ, he raised him up straight up out of the water, and the Spirit of God came down upon him, the bodily form and shape of a dove, and this voice rang out from heaven, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. When they came to John the Baptist and said, who art thou? You know what John said? And first of all, let me tell you what he didn't say. John did not say, well, you don't know who I am? 
I'm come here to, to identify Jesus for you. I've come here to point out Jesus for you. I've come here to fulfill prophecy. Malachi wrote about me. Isaiah wrote about me. He didn't say anything like that, did he? He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, if those Jews understood Isaiah chapter 40, they'd have known who he was. They didn't know who he was. He said, are you that prophet? He said, no, I'm not that prophet. Are you the Messiah? No, I'm not the Messiah. See, John never, never brought attention to himself. He always made sure that those who talked to him, that they understood that he was not the one he came to represent. He said, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And the joy of the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, he rejoices over the voice of the bridegroom. He says, I must decrease and he might increase. Now, I don't know of a man in the Word of God that has a greater display of the humility that we should clothe ourselves with any greater than John the Baptist. We see his credentials. We see his person. We see his work. And in John 1, certainly one of my favorite verses in the Bible, uh, a good friend of mine in Florida uh, emailed me the other day, and uh, he wanted to tell me that a word that I used in preaching in Vero Beach, Florida a couple years back, I used it properly. <laughs> well, I already knew that. <laughs> he said, you pronounce the name of Mordecai, Mordecai, and I wonder why you did that. And he says, one night I couldn't sleep, and I can't sleep, I opened my Bible and read it, and I went to the beginning of that, to where it in my Bible that shows you how to pronounce words. I want you to know, it says you pronounced it right. I don't always pronounce words right. I, I guess you, I didn't let the cat in the bag, did I? I mean, sometimes when I speak of Lazarus, I say Lazarus. And if I do, Karen always tells me. <laughs> I say Lazarus, Lazarus, Lazarus. But I think you know what I'm talking about, don't you? And when I say Emmaus, I'm right if I say Emmaus, I'm right. And when I look at over here at Timothy's mother and grandmother, and I read and I say you hear one named Lois and one Eunice, and I say Eunice, I'm right. So I say it's not Eunice, it's Eunice. No, it's not, it's Eunice. I stand on Eunice. <laughs> it's like one brother one time says, Well, you're down here in the south, uh, you say it Eunice in the north, in the south we say Eunice. Well, I'm going to say it you nice in the north, I'm going to say you nice in the south. And every once in a while when I say the word wrestling, I say wrestling. You know why I say wrestling? Because I'm from the south. I was raised in the country. But I think you know the difference when I say wrestling or wrestling. Am I even saying it different now? <laughs> no, let me get back where I was at. Anyway. <laughs> John the Baptist says, it's recorded to him five different times. He says, I am not worthy to lose the shoe ashes of his shoes. Now look over here in the seventh chapter of Luke, and there's a centurion. We spoke of him a few ago. This centurion is a Gentile Roman soldier. He has power, he has authority. He has a hundred men under him. He's there to keep order among the Jews in that particular day to be sure that there's no uprising, there's no rebellion, there's no insurrection, no plans for any of that among the Jewish people. But he's got a servant. And the Bible says a servant was sick nigh unto death, but the servant was nigh unto him. And we find this centurion sends the elders of the Jews to where Jesus is to get Jesus to come and to heal his servant. We find those Jewish elders coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and here's what they say about this man, this centurion. They said, he is worthy. The man that we've come to tell you about, he is worthy. He loveth our nation. He built us a son of God. He is worthy. Now we're talking about Jewish people, talking about a Roman Gentile who they do not want in their land, who is the enemy, so to speak. But this centurion is treating with such kindness and such love and compassion had taken such a sincere interest in these people and helped them in many different ways. The very first thing they tell the Lord about this man is, he's worthy. But on the way back, you know what the centurion says about himself? 
He sends friends to tell the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not worthy for thou to come under my roof. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. The Lord Jesus Christ, I've not found so great a faith, though not in all of Israel. And he says, I did not feel myself to be worthy to come to you. This man had the power to have sent soldiers and gotten the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't have to ask the Lord. He could send soldiers to got the Lord and brought him there, but he didn't do that. He sent the elders of the Jews there to beseech him to come, to beg him to come, to plead with him to come. And Jesus did. Jesus healed his servant. And the centurion says, I didn't feel worthy to come to you. And I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. What causes a person to feel this way? What causes a person to feel to be unworthy by nature? We feel pretty worthy by nature. We feel pretty entitled by nature, don't we? So what causes this? There's only one thing that causes this. And that's God dwelling in you that shows you that you are a great sinner in need of a great Savior. And when you're honest with yourself, you made a proper interpretation of your experience in life, you know you're not worthy. I'm not worthy this morning. I'm not worthy of God's favor and His grace and His blessings in my life. I'm, I'm just not. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Any of you want to raise a hand and, and say otherwise? This morning, I got the results I thought I'd get. The centurion, a Roman soldier, Gentile, man with power and authority that's there under the direction of Caesar, he says to this Jewish man, I'm not worthy of your presence. Then I read over Luke chapter 15 where a man has two sons. And the younger son comes to his father and says unto him, he actually is asking him for his inheritance before his father dies. He wants his inheritance before his father dies. And his father gives it to him. But he gives it to his older son as well, gives him a living. And the scripture says that he left home and wasted all that the father had given unto him. The father had worked for this. I don't know how much it was, but the father didn't have it given unto him. He worked for what he had, but he gave it to his son. And his son went and wasted it all on righteous living. That means ungodly behavior. That's what it means. He went into a far country. And he finally reached a point where he had to eat the, the husk that the, the hogs ate, you know, the, or the swine. He got a job feeding swine. And his meal was the husk from the food that he gave to the swine. This is a Jewish boy. You can't get any lower than that. You just can't get any lower than that. And then the Bible says he came to himself. He says, you know, he says, my father's servants got it better than I've got it. He says, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. Here's his words. I'm not worthy to be called his son. His servants have got it better than I do. I'm going home. And I'm going to ask just my father to just make me as a hired servant. And on the way back, as he got in sight of where he'd left so many years before, we find the father looking out. I just know the father had been looking daily. I just know the father had a hope in his heart. My son one day is coming back. My son one, my son one day is going to return. He's going to come back, and I want to be watching when he comes. I want to see him as quick as I can. And he saw the son, and the son got close enough to talk to him. And the son says, I'm not worthy to be called thy son. Now notice here, he never got to finish what he said earlier. He never got to say, just make me as one of the hired servants. He never got to say that. You know why? Because the father interrupted him. And the father says, bring the fatty calf, kill the fatty calf, bring my robe, put it in rest, put my ring on his finger and my shoes upon his feet. He never got to say, just make me one of thy servants. But twice he said, I am not worthy to be called thy son. We got a hymn, we sing like that, right? Lord, I'm not worthy to be called thy son. But our text says, they that should be accounted worthy of the resurrection and of the dead 
be counted worthy of that world. How are they accounted worthy? When by nature we're unworthy. And we have the testimony of Jacob that he was not worthy. We have the testimony of John the Baptist, he was not worthy. The testimony of a Roman centurion soldier that says, I'm not worthy. And we got the testimony of a son that left home. And I, I know you've heard this many times, but I think it's so important to remember this. He was a son before he left home. He was a son when he left home. He was a son in the far country. He was a son when he returned. His relationship never was changed in any way whatsoever. He was always a son. So what did he lose? He went to the far country. He lost the most valuable things of life. He lost fellowship with the father. He lost fellowship with the family. He lost the benefits of the father's home. I don't know what all they were, but I got a feeling before he thought he got all grown. You know, <laughs> it's amazing how, how people at a certain age just think they're grown and they're far from it. It's just amazing how people could think they know everything and know more than mother and father when they don't know diddly squat. <laughs> That's right. It's, just, it's amazing to hear him talk. <laughs> he lost it all. But his relationship never changed. And sometimes, you know, over here in the book of Ephesians, chapter one, 4 and verse 1, Paul said, I beseech you therefore by the mercies, excuse me, it's the wrong one. Ephesians 4 1. I beseech you therefore as a prisoner of the Lord that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. There's a big difference between vacation and vocation. Vocation is your station in life. Vacation is something you do every once in a while, if you're blessed to, to get away from it all, so to speak. That's vacation. Vocation is a daily thing. Vocation is a daily thing. I beseech you, therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called with all lowness and meekness, with long suffering, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. See, there's a way that you can walk worthy in the sight of God. Paul says we're to walk in this matter. We're to walk worthy of the Lord. Colossians 1 and 11 and 12, he says the same thing. To walk worthy of God in all pleasing. He writes in 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, and he says, walk worthy unto God who called you unto his kingdom and his glory. Now, he's not telling us to do something that we cannot do. We can walk worthy of the Lord. How do we do that? By walking according to God's word. By walking in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. By walking in the footsteps of the Lord and the master. Then we walk worthy, living a life of honesty and truthfulness and integrity. Uh, trying to do the best we can uh, to apply God's word to our lives. That we might uh, let our light shine before men. They might see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. When we do that, we walk in worthy, my friends, of the Lord and in his companionship and fellowship here in this world. But our text says, let's read it again here in Luke chapter 20, verse 35. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection of the dead, neither married nor given in marriage, neither can they die anymore, for they're equal unto the angels, nor the children of God being the children of the resurrection. They which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. There's coming a day when the Lord comes, when time shall be no more. He shall speak, bodies shall rise, body, souls, and spirits shall be reunited, and they shall meet the Lord in the air, and those that shall do that shall be accounted worthy of that world and the resurrection from the dead. Their worthiness is not in themselves, but in their Lord and their Master, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, For he hath made him, to make Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Romans 5 and 19, by the disobedience of one man, many, many were made sinners, but by the obedience of one, many were made righteous. Notice what it didn't say. It did not say by the obedience of many, many were made righteous. It's not based on your obedience, my obedience. You think you could be obedient enough to God that that would earn you in the glory? You think your obedience to God has been perfect, has been 100%, has been complete, it's been uh, all it could be? We know that's not true. 
But thank God for the doctrine that Brother Tim spoke about to us this morning of representation. When Jesus lived in this world, he lived the perfect life you could not live. He crossed all your T's you couldn't cross. He dotted all your I's you couldn't dot. He always lived in perfect communion with God the Father. He always done everything in perfection to the Father's will. And therefore, when he hung upon Calvary and represented his family out of every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, a people that man cannot number, but God does have them numbered, and God has them named. He put them in the Lamb's Book of Life, slain from the foundation of the world. And Jesus Christ fully represented them. And God saw the Son and recognized the work of representation, my friends, and declared that you, as a family of God, are counted worthy of the resurrection.